Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another video lecture. Today, we are going to be taking a look at our third theistic thinker, uh, Emil Fackenheim. Uh, I suppose I'll just switch over to the, the slides. So I'll start by saying I hope you had a, a good weekend. I hope the initial posts in the forums have been going well. It certainly seems like it. There's an awful lot of content there that I've been reading through, which is excellent. So um, turning over here to Emil Fackenheim, 20th century um, Jewish, German, Canadian thinker. Um, so he was born in uh, Germany and he was um, got to Great Britain and then sent over to Canada during World War II. Um, he was held in the internment camp for a little while, but after the war was, was finished, of course, he was released. Uh, and then he attended the University of Toronto, where he got a PhD, and he served as professor of philosophy for a number of years. And <clears throat> his own thinking <clears throat> is uh, uh, very much informed by his, his Judaism, and he was also a rabbi. Uh, there's a picture here, um, just... just off Amazon of the Jewish thought of Emil Fackenheim, a, a reader. So, uh, very interesting fellow. The, the piece we've got here is unfortunately a little bit short, but it's, it's, it's a right on topic, so it's a, a good piece, certainly. And this one gives us a, another theistic perspective on the meaning of life, but this time it's a specifically Jewish perspective. So, last time we saw Philip Quinn giving us uh, a version of how Christianity, specifically Christianity, gives life meaning. Now, in this piece, we're going to see Fackenheim giving us a more particularly Jewish view on the subject. So we've really got three points that come out of this, and, and this lecture should be horribly long. Uh, the piece itself, like I said, is fairly short. So human life gains whatever meaning it has from the encounter with the divine for Judaism. Uh, Although this encounter is a mystery, it's an utter miracle, there is a certain kind of content and structure that we can articulate about it. So we can talk about the features and make some sense of it, although it's impossible to make full sense of it. And lastly, it's really God's commanding acceptance of humanity that Fackenheim contends gives uh, human life the meaning it has and this really comes from the permanent relationship established between God and humans. So let's hear a little bit more about what Fackenheim has to say. As always, go to the original pieces and uh, read them. They've got much more detail than I can go through here. Of course, I could just simply read the pieces to you, um, but I think that's not really me doing my job. That's me just um, reading things that are already there rather than trying to do something to make sense of them or give them a little bit of a different structure, uh, articulate them in a, a somewhat different way so that if you've already gone through them and you're having some trouble figuring out exactly what's there, my aim is to be able to, to help you get a good handle on what's going on there, get a, a sense of the material and, and what the important points really are. So this encounter that Fackenheim talks about and really plays a central role in his account of the meaning of human life. So in Judaism, uh, you've got, and of course, Judaism and Christianity share a number of, of characteristics in their religious tenets, but are not identical. Um, so we could talk a lot more about the, the history of Judaism and Christianity and how, you know, Christianity comes out of Judaism, how they differ and how they're similar and, and so on. But you know, last, that's not our, our job in this course. So just a, a little bit, uh, and I'm not claiming to be you know, an absolute expert on Judaism, so if anything, this is sort of a step above common knowledge of, of Judaism. If anything I say here sounds wrong to you, feel free to point it out to me, send me an email, make a comment on the video or something. Uh, you bring it up in the forum post if you want. Um, so in Judaism, you get God conceived of as it, an infinite being. So in some sense, not all that surprising, at least not to us these days. Uh, though, of course, if you go back into the ancient world, when Judaism was, uh, I guess I'll use the phrase, a younger religion, uh, it, it stood out in an interesting way because of its conception of a single, infinite, all-powerful God, rather than having a, a pantheon or a cluster of gods um, who had varying levels of power and responsibility and were more uh, uh, 
they're human-like in their interactions and so on. Now, of course, the God of Judaism is, is infinite, um, transcendent in the sense, goes beyond the, the material world we have. Humans are, well, like humans are, finite, limited, um, temporal creatures. But in Judaism, one of the very interesting features, and this is something that sort of gets picked up in Christianity, but then in some sense maybe is set aside a little bit, uh, is that in Judaism, God and humans meet. <clears throat> and, and they meet uh, directly rather than having a kind of intermediary in there, such as, you know, famously Jesus. So this meeting, as, as Fackenheim talks about it, itself produces a kind of tension which, uh, a re really a tension of thought, uh, a problem for how to actually think about it, to understand it, how to conceptualize it. It's really this question, how can it happen? So what, you know, and, and that itself might seem odd, right? It's, well, how can it happen? Well, like any other meeting, right? Uh, they, they get together and, you know, humans and God can, can talk or exchange or, or whatever it is, just like two humans can, right? Well, not exactly, because if God is infinite, and we're serious about that, there's a real question there. How can a finite human meet an infinite God? Now, there's two ways of trying to just dissolve the tension and just, just get rid of it and say, okay, uh, there seems to be some kind of conceptual problem with a finite thing meeting an infinite thing. One way of trying to dissolve that tension and, and just get rid of it is just deny uh, that we ever actually encounter God. Just say this doesn't actually happen. Uh, and Fackenheim just mentions Epicureanism and, and modern deism. So, Epicureanism, uh, there's an ancient uh, Greek philosophy called Epicureanism. Epicurus was its founder. Uh, it was founded third, fourth, third century BCE um, and flourished through the Hellenistic period. So, <clears throat> say so roughly second century BCE to second, third century uh, current era. <clears throat> and it was very much a, a philosophy devoted to a pleasurable life and a peaceful life. Uh, but the, the part that really matters is that on Epicurus's view, the gods exist, gods plural. He was a Greek, you know, informed by Greek mythology, um, or what we now call Greek mythology, but back, back then it was just Greek religion. Uh, so he admitted that the gods exist, but he said they, they don't care about us, and they just aren't involved in human activities. So when Epicurus was alive, typical Greek, as, as well as what came to be Roman practice, uh, you know, of course, you, you sacrifice to the gods, and you stand in this kind of contractual relationship to them. If you do nice things for the gods, the gods will do nice things for you. Uh, so the gods are intimately concerned with humans and human affairs, and uh, you know, are willing to do things to try to help you if you do things to help them. But Epicurus wasn't having any of that. He said, look, if the gods exist, that means they're perfect beings. That means they're uh, not uh, uh, disturbed. They're not stressed out. They don't have concerns and worries. Humans do have concerns and worries. So obviously the gods just aren't involved with us. They don't care about us. They don't think about us. They don't watch us. They exist, but they're off somewhere else living their perfect existence. Now, deism is a, a different view a, a more modern view, as, as Fackenheim points out, though not, that doesn't have to be distinctly modern. But the modern deistic view really comes from, let's call it the 17th century, a current era, so a few hundred years ago. And this is really a conception of God as a kind of, of designer, a perfect designer. God can make the universe, design everything, set up the, the laws of nature and so on, figure out how it's all going to work and then just step back and not have to be involved anymore. So on a deistic view, God exists and creates everything and has some kind of, of oversight or foresight of what was going to happen, but isn't actively involved in human affairs anymore. So you know, if you, you pray to God and you want God to do something, well, either it's going to happen or it isn't, but God isn't gonna come and answer your prayer and really pay attention to what you're saying and, and then you know, give it to you under certain conditions and not under other conditions. So deistic God is one who's not actively involved in human affairs. This is the common point between Epicureanism and deism that, that Fackenheim is really drawing on. So on both of those views, what you have is a conception of God or the gods that just aren't actively involved in human affairs. Right? They don't come in and answer prayers or give assistance or anything like that. 
they've set things up, perhaps, right, but depending on exactly the view, but now they just aren't involved with us. They've, they've stepped back, so to speak, and left us to our own devices. So that's one way to try to deny this tension or, or get out of it. Now, uh, the, the tension produced by how can a finite human being meet with an infinite God? The other way to try to deny the tension is instead to view it as a mystical conflux in which the finite dissolves into the infinite and man suffers the loss of his very humanity. What does that mean? Well, this is where we get to Spinoza, 17th century um, Jewish thinker who moved to the Netherlands. Long story, but he, he was uh, raised as a, a, a Jew and then he was kicked out of Judaism for really his heretical views, which he himself thought were just really the logical consequence of um, what, what he was already taught and sort of basic tenets of Judaism and, and even Christianity. Um, and then mysticism, you know, we can really just try to give a, a brief definition of mysticism as um, kind of religious view that thinks ultimate reality uh, and, and transcends the categories of human understanding. So the ways in which we try to understand things you know, through our sense experience and, and rational thinking, try to think about a thing, list its qualities, right? What sort of predicates can truly be assigned to a subject in a sentence, right? Carl is sitting and giving a lecture right now. That's true. Carl, that's me. I'm really sitting in a chair. I'm really giving a lecture. Um, so mysticism says, you know, ultimate reality, in particular religious reality, God, uh, uh, religious experience, goes beyond anything we could ever explain to anybody in our words that we could fully understand with our human understanding. Um, it's that, that ultimate sort of reality, that meeting with God would be a kind of mystical conflict where you'd no longer really be human. Even. Now I think, and, and Spinoza really had a view similar to this. In fact, he thought, and this is where I think we can make the best sense of what Fackin and I was trying to get at with this tension. In Spinoza's view, he was, mystical certainly in some sense. Spinoza thought if you go just from basic tenets, as I said, of, of Judaism, Christianity, uh, we could expand this, I'd say Islam certainly, uh, perhaps other religions, but don't want to get us too sidetracked. Spinoza says, look, if you're committed to God being an infinite being, and so this I think is the good way to understand the fact that I'm getting at. If God is an infinite being, and you really mean that, you're not just you know, sort of throwing words about, you really mean God's infinite, then it follows that everything must be a part of God. Here's the argument. Look, I don't seem to be a part of God. Neither do my you know, glasses or the pictures around me or the books or whatever. Um, the, these things don't seem to be part of God. And furthermore, things like my glasses don't seem to be part of me. They seem to be something separate. I can take them off, put them down. Uh, you know, look at the birds outside, think about you. There are all sorts of things that aren't me. Uh, now, it's easy for something to not be me because I'm finite. I'm finite and the glasses are finite, which means we can be separated. We're different sorts of things. I end at one point, the glasses start somewhere else. There's some space between us. That makes sense. If God is really infinite, then you can't understand God that way. There's no spot at which God stops, which means there can be no spot at which some being outside of God starts. So it's very easy for me to conceive of myself as different from my glasses or the trees outside or the books on my shelf or you. But if God's really infinite, and we're really committed to that as, as sort of a starting point, which Spinoza, he took that, he said, look, I'm just gonna define God as this infinite being. Um, you know, nothing's more powerful than God, where God could do everything and anything. What does that mean that follows Spinoza thinks? Everything is literally a part of God, which means God is actually just the totality of all things. Famous, uh, Spinoza famously expressed this in a, a Latin phrase, which really means God is nature, nature is God. For Spinoza, God and nature are just the same thing. Why? Because you can't separate out nature from God. If God is an infinite being, God is the totality of all things, and there can't be anything separate from God, right? which includes you and I. So this, I think, really brings this tension that Fack and I was talking about into clear form, at least for me it does. If God is truly infinite, as Spinoza believed, as Fackenheim believes, as the Jewish tradition believes, as many people believe, then it seems to be intellectually impossible for us to be something separate from God. Now, 
even if we are somehow something separate from God, but God remains infinite, if we think about this meeting that Fackenheim is talking about, that's really part of the core of, of the Jewish tradition, how do you get something infinite meeting something finite without having the finite just as in option two here, just sort of disappearing, dissolving into the infinite, right? You lose your, your identity, your individuality. As Fackenheim puts it, your very humanity. You cease to be what you are, right, as a specific individual, finite existing being, and you become instead just part of that infinite God. And so you become, you're just literally part of God, not some other thing. Now, Judaism rejects these options, right? It says we do encounter God, so it rejects Epicureanism, rejects deism, but it also rejects the view that we just become part of God, that we get lost in God. Rather, it wants to say that we remain separate from God, even though we can meet God. And uh, Judaism just remains committed to this, the, the miraculous nature of the meeting, that it's just something we can't fully comprehend. Now, even though we can't fully comprehend it, we can make sense of it. And so we're going to get onto that in a moment. Now, I think this really captures the, the upshot of what Fackenheim is getting at this quotation here. As he puts it, in the eyes of Judaism, whatever meaning life acquires derives from this encounter. The divine accepts and confirms the human in the moment of the meeting. But the meaning conferred upon human life by the divine human encounter cannot be understood in terms of some finite human purpose, supposedly more ultimate than the meeting itself. For what could be more ultimate than the presence of God? The presence of God then, as Martin Buber puts it, is an inexpressible confirmation of meaning the question of the meaning of life is no longer there. But were it there, it would not have to be answered. Uh, Martin Buber, another very interesting uh, thinker, sort of religious existentialist, uh, somebody worth looking up if you are you are sort of interested in what Fackenheim is, is talking about here, uh, resonates in interesting ways as well with, with Tolstoy, uh, certainly Quinn to an extent, sort of sort of like Kierkegaard as well, but I'll, I'll just sort of leave it at that, again, not to get us distracted. So the meaning of life for, for humans, at least according to the Jewish tradition, which is really what Fackenheim is trying to give us here, really derives from the encounter between God and humans. So we need to hear a little bit more about this encounter, but of course we've got this issue, uh, this sort of paradox or, or sort of tension that it seems like we can't fully understand that meaning, because there is something that really escapes our finite human understanding of thinking about how the finite can come and be the infinite. Now, it's supposed to be that meaning that really answers the question of what's the meaning of life, right? If that's, that's what we want to say, really the meeting with, with God. But it's not even just that, it's not just the meeting. Um, Fackenheim thinks what results from that meeting gives human life uh, meaning even outside of it. So the feature of the meeting between God and humans that can be expressed, that can be understood you know, fairly, fairly well, things that in some sense escape paradox. So first, the meeting is temporally limited. Like other meetings between finite creatures, you know, say between two humans, it doesn't last forever. So God comes and God goes. Now, of course, as Fackenheim points out, we don't always know where God is or why God isn't here, but God's encounter with humans isn't something that's, that's perpetual. God isn't always here. God is like other sorts of beings, even though God is infinite, in the sense that God can be gone. God cannot be around, which again, gets us back to that sort of paradox of God is really infinite. This is what Spinoza struggled with. How could it ever be the case that God isn't right here? How can anything be separate from God if God's infinite? It just doesn't make sense. To be infinite means to be unbounded, to have no limit, right? That there's nothing outside of it. But on the, the Jewish view that Fackenheim is giving us, the meaning is temporally limited. It doesn't last forever. God's here sometimes, God isn't in others. Judaism affirms humanity's finitude and God's infinitude. And when God's gone, those times of divine absence, as he calls them, derive their meaning from times of divine nearness. So when God is gone, it has some kind of meaning and that meaning derives from when God is around. So there is some kind of, of meaning or perhaps purpose or importance to God's absence. 
God commands us to be human. This is third, and we ought to obey. God gives us a, a set of rules to live by, has a certain way that we're supposed to live. And humans are supposed to do that. We're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, right here. So God commands humans, and of course, there's a long tradition of, of Jewish law. And again, we're not going to go into details. It's not really what this class is about. But God gives commandments to humans, right? Tells us things we should do, things we shouldn't do. Now, humans get divine grace from following that. It's really, uh, or maybe I should say in following that rather than from following that. Because as Fackenheim points out, it's not a kind of uh, contractual relationship I'm going to backtrack that on the next slide. It is, in some sense, a contractual relationship. Uh, but it's not a, a contractual relationship where the only reason you have to live up to um, sort of your side of the bargain is from some promised reward in the future. So God gives humans divine commandments, tells us ways to live, things to do, things not to do. And it's in doing those things that divine grace is contained. It's not a matter of God sort of giving us a list of things to do. You then do it just for the sake of some kind of reward after. That's not the, the Jewish conception. Rather, drawing on the distinction I was making earlier, it's intrinsically good to, or intrinsically valuable, to follow divine commandment. It's not instrumentally good. It's not that you're merely doing what God tells us to do um, because God's going to make it worth your while eventually. Rather, you should do what God tells us to do because that's really the best thing there is to be done. Nothing can be more important or more ultimate than God's uh, purpose and, and attitude towards humans. Okay, and this takes us around to this relationship between God and, and humans. Here again, there are some different uh, characteristics or expressions that Fackenheim says we can articulate and make sense of. And he says, really, there's, there's four of them. So even though we can't fully understand the encounter between God and humans, because it's this kind of miraculous mystery that really goes beyond our, our full comprehension, but yet Judaism is committed to saying really occurs, and it certainly can occur, it has occurred. There are these four interrelated expressions of this encounter. Right? So first, there's a dimension of meaning and the very fact of being commanded uh, as a human by the divine. To be thus commanded is to be accepted as humanly responsible. Now, what does Fackenheim really mean here? Well, again, going back to this notion that God gives us a kind of divine commandment, we've got a way to live. If we think in terms of, you know, how ought we to live? What's, what's the right way to live a human life? And that's certainly one, one part of this question, you know, what's the meaning of life? Really, there seems to be a question there of how should we live? It's, and so part of what we're trying to tease out in this course is just what that question, what is the meaning of life? What is it asking exactly? Or we talk about the meaning of life. What kind of thing are we even talking about? And we're going to see some, some different views on it. Um, I think this helps draw out at least part of it. And this is something running through Tolstoy as well, and Quinn. And we're going to see it being a re recurring theme. Really, to, to ask about the meaning of life or to think about it is to think in part about how we should live. Right? Presumably, a meaningful life is a good thing. And so if it's a good thing, it's something we want to have or, or you know, something we want to be, perhaps, uh, be a kind of creature with meaning. Fackenheim says this is really part of what God's commandments give us. It gives us a structure that we can live by. In fact, the ultimate structure. And it makes us humanly responsible. We're responsible for what we do and what we don't do. Because, because God has given us, in a sense, this, this template of a good life, living up to that standard, being able to, to meet those demands, really is what it is for us to lead a good life. Uh, and because God has given us that template, it must be achievable. Now, second, the acceptance of the human by the commanding love makes possible and indeed mandatory human self-acceptance. This follows at least in part from what I was just saying, that because God 
uh, commands us in a certain way but loves us, um, really what's going on there is, is a sort of acceptance of the human by God, right? God doesn't sort of make us and, and cast us off and, and be rid of us. Rather, God is willing to stand in this relationship to us uh, that really sets certain standards for us and, and tells us if you live up to those standards, you will indeed be uh, accepted, right? This is, this is really what it's all about. This is what I want you to do. Now, given that humans can live up to that, and they are accepted by God in this sense, human self-acceptance, right? a kind of self-love, accepting what we are, the sorts of creatures we are, how we've been made, how we live, itself is something that we need to do. Right? Loving humanity itself is part of what it is to be a good human, have a good human life. Third, the relation between God and humans is mutual. Now, Fackenheim explains this a little bit. He says, along with the commandment handed over for human action, goes the promise of divine action. And because divine action makes itself contingent upon human action, a relationship of mutuality is established. God gives to man a covenant that is a contract. He binds himself by its terms and becomes a partner. So like I was saying, just back on the last slide, there is a kind of contractual relationship, a covenantal relationship between God and humans. So God basically gives us a, a set of rules, strikes a bargain with us, if you will, says, look, if you do these sorts of things and, and live your life in this kind of way, then I'm going to do these sorts of things for you. So there is, in some sense, a bit of a tit for tat. But, as Fackenheim was, was, I was explaining, saying on the previous slide, the whole point of really following God's commandments isn't just to get that reward at the end. It's not like following God's commandments is uh, just purely instrumental. Rather, it's something to be done for its own sake. Although God has given a promise, made a covenant, a contract, about what's going to happen as a result of following that. And in fact, uh, Fackenheim talks about that a little bit. Um, so we'll come to this fourth point. I'll, I'll just come back to this. So there's this mutual covenant between God and humans, but God really maintains the covenant through unilateral love. Why is that? Well, it's because humans break it so darn much. And this is something Fackenheim talks about. He says, look, if God were only willing to keep the covenant, keep the contract on condition that humans kept up their side of the bargain, it would have been broken and, and gone pretty much as soon as it was made. Uh, Fackenheim's point here, and, and this is a bit of a theme in, in Judaism, is that humans are really bad at keeping their, their side of the bargain. Um, they, they fail to live up to the standards of, of covenantal or contractual existence with God frequently, but God is always willing to keep his side of the bargain as long, and maybe I shouldn't even use that term, God is willing to keep his side of the covenant so long as humans are willing to live up to their side. Now, Fackenheim, right near the end of the piece, uh, is, is talking about um, performing the covenant for the sake of God. So I'm just going to read a couple of other lines here. Um, in God always keeping his side of the covenant, uh, but humans frequently breaking their side, Fackenheim says this. This is on page 26. He says, The human power to perform the commandment, while impaired, is not destroyed. And he who cannot perform the commandment for the sake of God, as he is supposed to do, is bidden to perform it anyway. For performance which is not for his sake will lead to performance which is for his sake. Now, really, what's he getting at there? So the best sort of life that can be led, the most meaningful kind of life, is one where we follow God's commandments, we live up to the covenant for its own sake. So we do what God asks us to do really for the sake of God, not for the sake of any kind of promise or reward afterward but just because that's what God wants us to do. And God is really the ultimate supreme being. So there can be no purpose or, or no importance or value that really transcends or goes beyond God. So if we're wondering about the meaning of life, it all has to come to the human relationship to God. Right? That's really what it's derived from. Now, because we are pretty bad at keeping up our side of the covenant, we keep breaking it, um, you know, what, how, how do we get back towards that best kind of life? Well, performing what the covenant wants us to do 
even if it's not for the sake of God to start with, even if it's kind of a struggle, even if we're striving to perform uh, what we're supposed to, to get something out of it, a meaningful life or whatever it might be. This is really what Fackenheim's getting at, that sort of going through the motions, doing what you're supposed to do, even though you're not doing it just for its own sake, is a way to get yourself to doing it for its own sake. So thinking again about that intrinsic instrumental distinction, you can start living according to the covenant instrumentally, really looking towards some kind of promised reward or, or you know, something better to get out of it. But that will lead you to really doing it for its own sake. You come to see meaning and value in abiding by the covenant by itself, rather than for some uh, other kind of promise. So, uh, and God is always willing to uphold God's side of the covenant. So it's, it's open-ended, right? Whenever humans are willing to live up to the covenant, there's God waiting to uh, welcome humans back. Now, it's this, it's really this divine nearness, Fackenheim thinks, uh, and then God's covenant that he provides humanity in those times of nearness, and then how humans act during times of divine farness. You know, God has come, God has met humans, he's given humans the covenant, right, told us how to live, right, what to do. God is, so far as, you know, I can tell right now, not here, right? I, I don't see God anywhere. I'm not meeting God. You probably aren't either, at least not in that sense of, of having a direct encounter, right? Like God showing up. And it's not the kind of thing I think you could really mistake, right? If you have to sort of wonder, oh, did I just meet God? You probably, like, you didn't meet God, right? And then I think that comes through in, in what Fackenheim's saying. So even though God isn't here right now, God has given us a way to live and really, um, during these times of divine farness, it's still from that time of divine nearness that really gives this meaning that extends across all human life. So nothing further is required, right? Questions about the meaning of life really terminate in questions about humans' relationship to God. There's just not more to, to think about or, or wonder about or really um, to grasp for. Right? If you live in the proper relationship to God, there's just nothing that could be missing, essentially, is really what Fackenheim is, is trying to get at. Now, that really takes us to the end of Fackenheim. Like I said, it's a fairly short piece. Um, not right away. We're going to take a look at William Lane Craig next. But we're going to get around to Robert Nozick in a couple of days. And Nozick is going to raise some, some questions. He's going to make some points. It's not just all questions. But I think part of the value in his piece is really to raise some, some tough questions for a view like Fackenheim's here, uh, which really, you know, call into question whether or not what Fackenheim has said here is, is satisfactory. Now, Nozick's going to motivate those points. He's going to give us some reasons to think that we really can raise good questions about this. Nozick himself thinks that the answers aren't very easy. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a segue in the course going from these theistic responses to some alternative responses. So we're gonna see Nozick really raising questions here. So even taking what Fackenheim has said, um, you know, if there's meaning between God and humans, even if we met God and God said, here's what your purpose is and here's how I want you to live, Nozick at least thinks we could still ask good questions about God, but why God wants that to be our purpose, whether or not we should live according to that purpose and so on. But I'm not gonna give it all away. So if you think those sorts of questions are, are fruitful ones, stay tuned for Nozick. If you think those questions aren't fruitful ones, stay tuned for Nozick. Uh, because whether you, you like them or not, you can still engage with Nozick to see what kind of merit there is in the approach he wants to give us for, for this. Uh, one other point I wanna raise here uh, and it's, it, it sort of comes up in Nozick, but it's worth just raising at this point as well, is that, and I've got this as one of the discussion questions, so I'll take a look at it there as well. In the Jewish tradition, there, there's fairly clear consensus that there's some kind of afterlife of some sort, but there's really no clear consensus about what it is. Uh, so if you look into various you know, Christian traditions, different Christian denominations and so on, they've tried to work out more or less clearly 
what exactly happens after humans die. You know, what, what heaven's like, what hell's like, where we go, um, how one gets into heaven or stuck in hell or, or you know, other various sorts of in-between places. Judaism doesn't have such a clear conception. So, you know, generally speaking, uh, if you were speaking to people in the Jewish tradition and say, yeah, there's some kind of afterlife, but then if you ask them, you know, what's that like? How do we get there? Uh, questions of detail like that, the answers are, are not going to be as clear, which isn't to say there are no answers, right? Uh, but perhaps there's too many answers. So there's not a single sort of clear, detailed conception of exactly what the afterlife is, afterlife is like for the Jewish tradition. So a question to be raised here, and this is what Fackenheim's saying, does uh, human life have to continue after earthly death in some fashion, any fashion, a particular fashion, for our earthly life to have existence? So I suppose that the possibility I'm raising is this, what Fackenheim has told us here, there's really no uh, a meaning that could go beyond human's relationship with God. What if human life just ends in death? So we live in this covenantal relationship with God. You may or may not meet God, um, but really living according to what God wants out of us is the best thing there could be. But is it still worth it if you just wind up dying and then it's oblivion forever? Right? There's no afterlife, there's no eternity, there's, there's no uh, immortality associated with it. So do, do we need some kind of view of the afterlife? Thinking back to Tolstoy, it certainly seemed like what Tolstoy really wanted was an afterlife, some kind of pleasurable afterlife that gave everything meaning and purpose. Now, perhaps what Tolstoy also wanted was a, an anthropomorphic, a human-like, uh, infinite being like God, because of course he talks a lot about the infinite. But then a lot of the reasons he seems to give for needing that connection to the infinite, or for the infinite to give human life meaning, seems to be some kind of connection to the afterlife and immortality. It seems to be a big motivator for Tolstoy. It also seems to be a motivator for Quinn. And if you remember Quinn, what we are talking about at the end of last week, Quinn talking about complete meaning, he's talking about teleological and axiological meaning, and the existence of, of heaven and a blissful afterlife can guarantee axiological meaning for all human lives, even if those earthly lives involve you know, suffering and death. So, the afterlife certainly has an important role to play for, for Quinn, I think certainly for Tolstoy. We just don't really get it here in Fackenheim's view. That's it's not really what he's talking about. It's not what he's focused on. It's not what the Jewish tradition is really uh, focused on. Right? The, the, if anything, the focus is more on how to live your life here and now. And then you know, questions about well, what happens after that. Well, you know, this, they're good questions, but maybe we don't have great answers. Maybe it's just not something we're supposed to know yet. So the question I'm really trying to pose here is, do we need some particular conception of the afterlife or, or immortality for God, God's existence, God's intent or, or purpose or desires for humans? Um, do we need that kind of afterlife and immortality for God to be able to give humans some kind of meaning, right? depending on what we think that meaning is? This is something we'll come back to we're looking at Nozick, at least in part, and then we're going to have a whole little unit in the course. Uh, so, so after we, we take a look at Nozick, uh, shortly thereafter, we're going to be turning to questions of death and what death really is, uh, and thinking about the afterlife, what the afterlife is, and thinking about immortality, because the afterlife and immortality are things that we could separate and, and take apart, at least in some sense, which is exactly what we're going to see. So that is all I've got for you today. Hope you're all doing well, and tomorrow I will be posting a, another um, lecture that's next time on William Lane Craig. That reading's not in our readers. The Fackenheim piece is in our reader. The William Lane Craig reading is up on his website, Reasonable Faith. Um, that link is up on Moodle. It's a, a, a transcript of really the first part of a, a longer debate that Craig had with uh, a couple of other people. Um, let me just pull it up for a moment. Uh, it was, uh, he, he debated, and this was back in 2018, with uh, Jordan Peterson and Rebecca uh, Goldstein on what the meaning of life was. And so what you get in the, just the reading there, uh, it's a couple thousand words, 
is Craig's remarks, uh, opening remarks, about why he thinks religion, particularly Christianity, but, but religion, I guess, a little more broadly, is really necessary for a meaningful life. So he thinks, really, if you're an atheist, you know, you're a scientific materialist, humanist, something like that, you really can't give a good answer to the meaning of life because of the cold hard facts that, that science really gives us about the universe and what it is and, and where we're ultimately headed with it. So I'll be back tomorrow with a lecture on that. Until then, have a great night. Uh, and I'll, no, you'll see me later. I keep screwing that part up. Um, so I'll, you'll see me then. <laughs> Bye for now.